Good morning, Confirmation Kids. Great to have you with us once again. We are just about at the halfway point in terms of our program, and it's so nice to see all of you here today. We're going to be dealing with a, a tough topic, and one that a lot of Catholics wrestle with. Why do you have to go to a priest to have your sins forgiven? Okay? Um, why can't you just tell God, Lord, forgive me? Right? That's a, that's a big one, right? So we are going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about sin. Ooh, not a very nice topic. But at some point in our lives, as followers of Jesus, we have to talk about sin. What is this sin thing all about? And um, what do we do when we sin and when we make mistakes and when we do things that does not please God? So let's listen very attentively today. And um, if you have anything you want to talk out, just put your hand out. Now, this is the, um, the last time we're going to be meeting in the general group. From the next meeting, we're going to go back to our small groups because we kind of miss hearing you guys talk out. Confirmation is all about you talking back to us and telling us what you understand, what you don't understand, what is your opinion. That's how we grow, okay? So we're kind of missing that because we are in such a large group here. But it's okay. We tried our best, and you guys have been really doing an excellent job. So I'll ask Paula to come forward to introduce our topic, and we'll go from there. So you, this is your, we are on lesson 10. Paula will tell you what page to turn to. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I hope everyone's had a chance to let some of the stuff we've learned sink in and put into practice, especially through our challenges of the week. So let's do a little bit of a recap. Can anyone tell me what the theme or the topic was for last session? Sorry? Uh, that was the one previous. So that was number seven. We did number eight last week. Anyone else? Any hands? Okay, so the topic was, how do I get there? And the power and the purpose of the sacraments. So can anyone tell me how many sacraments we have in total? Red. Seven? Correct. And can anyone name them? Okay, just shout out, put your hand up and say, what's the first one? Second? Yes. Matrimony is a good one. Okay, another one that you guys have had? I'm sorry, you have to... Was that reconciliation? Okay, we've got reconciliation. Confirmation. What other one have you had? In the back. Communion. Holy orders, and there's one still left. Anointing of the sick. Very good, you guys are doing great. Okay, so like I said, you've had, you've had three of them. You're working on your fourth, most of us, or most of you. I don't know if those who have yet uh, to complete their baptism have happened, but anyway, but most of you are working on your, or your fourth uh, sacrament, the, con re uh, the con uh, confirmation, sorry. Okay, so now let's have a show of hands. Who did the last week's challenge? So the first one was do something small for God. And some of the suggestions were read a child a story from the Bible, pick up trash around the school or your neighborhood, or do an extra chore. Any hands for that one? Okay, so does anyone want to share what they did specifically? 
You cleaned your room? Oh, well, that's great. Um, anyone else want to share? In blue. I'm sorry. Jamie, did you catch that? In blue. <clears throat> to see us help others with. Um, okay, how about anyone do number two? Ask God for, to help you sincerely forget, forgive someone who has hurt you. Anyone do that one? Good. Does anyone want to share what they did? Or no? <laughs> okay. Um, how about number three? Take advantage of the sacraments. Go to Mass. An extra mass, not just the Sunday mass, or go to confession. Did anyone do that one? Well, you know what? Any little thing that we do helps us to grow spiritually. So, today we're going to get a little bit more into depth of the sacrament of reconciliation or confirmation. And the subject is, why tell my sins to a priest? and the healing power of confession. When we want to perfect something, we have to look at what are our problem areas. What is holding us back from getting better? In baseball, we might think about putting more of our body into our swing, or in baking, um, working the dough better, or having the right ingredients. Or in gaming, it might be not enough practice or not enough XP. This applies to our spiritual growth as well. It is simply impossible to grow without growing, looking at our problems. And an examination of, our, of conscience is what helps us to do that. It is when you think about your life, your attitudes and actions, and determine whether you have sinned or how you need to grow and change. One way to do this is to think about the Ten Commandments and consider how you have or have not lived up to God's law. And the Ten Commandments are taken from Exodus 20, verse, 20, uh, verse 2 to 17. Can anyone tell me what the first of the Ten Commandments is? I'll give you a clue. It has to do with God. Sorry, am I hearing someone? Oh, sorry. Very good. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have any gods besides me. Anyone know number two? Yes. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. And you know what? This one is a biggie. I find that we live in a society that uses God's name in vain all the time. And it actually, interiorly, I cringe every time I hear God's name used out of place. Sometimes we say, oh my, I tell my everybody I know, whether they're adults or children, you know what? You don't call on God unless you need him. Because when you need him, he's just going to think that you're playing wolf again and, oh, you're just using my name in vain. You know what? When we call on God, we should be either calling on him to ask for help or to call on him to give him thanks and praise. Don't use God's name just to say, oh my, all oh, that happened? Like, that, God has not, that has nothing to do with God. So that's when we're using God's name in vain. So then the number three is, anyone? Okay, number three. Keep, the God, keep God's day holy. We consider the Sunday God's day. 
And you know what? Sometimes we don't use that day for God. Sometimes we don't go to Mass. Sometimes we think that we have to go to other events besides Mass, but God has given us the rules for our betterment. They are for our spiritual good to keep God's day holy. And when we start our day with God, everything goes right. So remember on Sunday, and we actually start Mass, the Sunday Mass on Saturday evening. So if you go to Saturday Mass, it is still considered the Sunday Mass. But to keep God's day holy, don't do things that you don't need to do, that you should be doing other days. Do those things on those other days and keep God's day holy. So those first three commandments refer to God. The next, three, the next seven commandments are actually for our betterment. What is the fourth commandment? Anyone else? Okay, in red. Not quite, but that's one of them. Honor your father and your mother. So God gave us the order. You know what? He told us to honor him first and above all, and then starts with our parents. You know what? God gave us life through our parents, so we have to honor them. And then the other six commandments all follow in order of the things that help us to have a good life. Like, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, or in other words, lie. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife. So all the commandments help us in doing a, a, an examination of conscience to prepare ourselves and to see where we're falling down. And through the guidance of the priest, he sometimes helps us to realize, for one, if we're saying that uh, sin over and over again, that maybe we're not quite perfecting it and that we need to work a little harder at it. And so now we're going to start with our opening prayer, which you are going to find on page 85 of your book. And you might, or I hope you all recognize the prayer, because we say this prayer every single Sunday at Mass we open up with. So all together, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, blessed Mother Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Amen. last lesson we talked about baptism, how it makes us children of God, washes away our sins, and raises us to new life. Unfortunately, even though we have these incredible graces, we still fall. We still make mistakes and wrong choices. We still miss the mark. The Greek word for sin means to miss the mark. In archery, it means anything but the bullseye. So today we're going to talk about sin, missing the mark, how it affects us, how it affects our relationships with others and with God. That's burning as Catholics, we have this beautiful sacrament of reconciliation, of confession, that we get to go and we get to confess our sins. One of the questions I get asked most as a Catholic is, why do you have to go to confession to a priest? 
And I normally say, well, in James 5, 16, it says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So we see the beauty of confession, that it not only heals us, but that in the future, it gives us the grace to once again hit the mark. When I was growing up, I had these cousins who were incredibly good at sports. Now, my siblings and I were athletic. We were swimmers, runners, gosh, skiers. But these guys were game guys, you know? Any game you mentioned, and they were incredible at that. And after a minute, I was always kind of jealous of them. I thought, I don't know, we're pretty athletic. How come they are so much better at every single game that we play? It wasn't until years went by that I realized these guys didn't just work hard. They didn't just know the rules. They got the goal of the game. They knew that, yeah, in football, you're trying to get the ball to the end zone as often as you can, but they also knew stuff like, well, if the ball's high, don't just run randomly to wherever you see the ball. They knew that in baseball, you're not just trying to get the other team out and score as many runs as possible. They knew stuff like, if you're playing shortstop and there's a guy on first and a guy on third, and the ball's hit to you, here's what you do with the ball. Because they knew the goal, they got the game. They got how fun soccer is supposed to be. They got how fun hockey is supposed to be. I was out there in the ice rink, racing back and forth, it looking like an idiot helping nobody. Meanwhile, my cousins were the lead scorers on every hockey team they ever played on from Pee Wees to Division I. The point is, they just didn't know the rules. They knew the goal. They knew that their game wasn't just some kind of random event, wasn't some kind of accident. They knew there was a point to it. Oftentimes, we go through life like it's just random, like it's just an accident, like there's no purpose. So, I don't know, do whatever you want out on the field and try not to hurt anybody. But we know that life is not an accident. You were created on purpose. There's a goal to life. Now the goal of life is not just to become rich. The goal of life is not to become famous or popular. The goal of life isn't even just to be a good guy or a good girl. The goal of life is to become a certain kind of person. A person who's fully alive. In the words of Saint Irenaeus, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. You know, if there's a goal to life, that means there's also gonna be rules to life. You know, when you're playing soccer, there's, there's rules. There's, if there's a goal, there's gonna be some have-tos. There's gonna be some things you ought to do. Not just things if you want to. For example, it's not just, well, kick the ball if you want. Pick it up if you want. You leave the field if you want. Use a baseball bat if you want. In order to play soccer and accomplish the goal, there's gonna be rules like, in order to score, you have to kick the ball into the net while following the other rules of soccer. Yeah, there's some if you want to's, but if there's a goal to it, there's gonna be some have to's. You might call these things commandments. Now, are those commandments, are those rules there to restrict our freedom? Absolutely not. The rules are there so that you can enter into the game with absolute joy and abandon. The rules are not there to limit us. The rules are there to help us accomplish the goal of life. God's plan for your life is more, not less. God says through Jeremiah the prophet, I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for your woe. Plans for a future full of hope. God's plan for your life is that you know him, that you love him, and that you serve him in this life in such a way as to live with him forever in the next. And because there's a plan for life, that means there's, that means there's gonna be some odds. There's a way to play the game of life that leads to victory. There's a way to play the game of life that leads to defeat. Imagine, imagine getting to the end of your life and realizing all of a sudden that you missed out on the entire point of living. You didn't know how to do it. It'd be 10,000 times worse than getting to the end of a game and realize you're going the wrong direction. God's commandments are his rules of play, not because he made them up, but because he knows that they lead to more life. So lies tear down relationships, be a person of truth. Greed drives people to cheat, be a person who gives. Lust uses people. Be a person who loves. Gossip tears down. Be a person who builds up others with your words. God's commandments lead to more life. Sin isn't the secret joy of living. Sin is its poison.
guess we'll start with the quiz first. So in segment one, So in segment one, the first question is, which of, the relati of his relatives did Father Schmidt say they were insanely good at sports? So you can raise your hand, yep. Which that right? His cousins, yes, so it should be C. And the second one is the blank are God's rules that allow us to be free. Yep. What's that? Why can't you hear? Should be, if you see here, right? A little bit? Oh, this is a little bit. Okay. Sorry? Rule of life, close. What, do, what are the ten rules we have? Yep. Commandments, exactly. So number two should be commandments. Uh, for this one here, it says the commandments are God's rules that allow us to be truly... Uh, a is... Rigid, B free, C limited, and D judgmental. Yep. Free, excellent. Yep. All right, so... We'll go on with the lesson. I'll have a few things, so make sure you have a pen and, or a pencil or a pen ready for you, okay? Uh, we'll just go over, I'll have a few things for you to raise your hands to. If you could participate, that would be great, all right? So, the video again talks about to us the importance of rules. But first, I know it's taking away from the second video a little bit, it's important to go over definitions of this week, right? So if you're looking at the glossary, and I'll read over the definition as well. I think it's 240, you want a second, 246. If you're looking at the word sin, right? On here, if you want to underline words, that's fine. I will help define some of them for you as well, in case you're confused. It says, sin is a deliberate thought, word, deed, or omission, contrary to God's plan that offends God and harms ourselves and others. So in this case, omission is meaning a failure to do something one ought to do or should do. So making the right choice, right? You fail to make the right choice. All right? So you can underline any words that are important. But remember, sin is deliberate, meaning you are choosing to do this. All right. So what exactly does that definition mean, right? I always remind, especially my students, that we are human and mistakes make us human. So in that way, we're not perfect. And that means sometimes we choose not to make the right choice, right? So all of us, therefore, sin. And God helps us along the path of how to choose the right choice through the Ten Commandments, right? Makes us free that way. We have structure. We have a path to follow. All right, so I have a scenario here. So since we're all in school, so even me, I teach, for example, I'll use the classroom as a scenario. So I'll go over the choices first, then you can raise your hand to which one you choose. So would you rather have a classroom with rules or without rules? Okay, so who would choose a classroom with rules? All right, excellent. And who would choose a classroom without rules? So I don't see anybody. All right. Oh, one hand there. Okay, perfect, that's fine, right? It's good to have different choices too. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to take a few moments. If you want, use somewhere in your page of your book. There's, I know there's some, un, like some lines somewhere here in your book, or use even the side of the pages that you're reading from. Just write down either a word, a phrase, you can draw an image or a symbol of what comes to mind when you think of a classroom with rules. Okay, so I'll read that again. You're gonna jot down either a word, a phrase, a symbol, or draw an image. Something that comes to mind whenever you think of a classroom with rules. So for example, I think of the word structure. We'll share our answers after if anyone wants to. When you're done, just look up so I can see that you're done. Excellent. 
Okay, so on the flip side of that question, you're gonna take a few moments to jot down a word or phrase, a symbol or an image that comes to your mind when you think of a classroom without rules. So for my example, I choose the word with a classroom without rules, I choose the word chaos. Does anyone want to share an example that they have? With or without? Remember, nothing's right or wrong yet. In the red hoodie? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's that? Disaster, excellent. Yes. All right. So, the questions I always ask is, are they the same? So some of the answers we have aren't the same, right? Some people think without rules it's fun. Some people be disoriented, right, without rules. Some people think it's organized with rules. Some people think it's boring with rules. Sometimes they oppose each other. Sometimes they don't. All right, so I chose, for example, structure and chaos. Some people chose different things too. Sometimes rules are hard to follow and it doesn't have to be a good, like a happy thing, right? But they're there for a reason. And the Ten Commandments, they're there for a reason as well. They're rules that God requires us to follow in order to truly be, and one of the answers there was free, in order to be with God, right? So think of your example for this. With rules, we have structure and a righteous path, path to follow. So God instructs us to follow him by his commandments. Sometimes not following the rules could be fun, right? Or sometimes it's boring to follow the rules. But to follow the rules, it's important in our life to create that structure. And priests, they help us along that path as well. We confess our sins in order to ask for forgiveness, and in order to continue down God's path. Otherwise, we carry the burden or that heavy load and the hardship of sin without confession. So we're gonna to continue to talk about the importance of the priest's role in our lives and in the church with our next video and our presenter. Thank you. When God gave me the Ten Commandments, I imagine that was a pretty lousy day. You just imagine the scene, here comes God and says, okay everyone, I'm God, here's how this thing is gonna go down. All those things you like doing, stop it. At least, <laughs> that's how we can imagine it. But if that's how we imagine it, we're not reading the story. What does the story say? It shows the story of these people of Israel who are living as slaves, that's all they've ever known, hundreds of years. They believe they will live and die as slaves and no one will care, and along comes Yahweh. And not only does he say he cares about them, he says that he loves them. Now this is remarkable, this is incredible. Up until Yahweh reveals himself, up until the Old Testament, all of the pagan gods, they were powerful, they might be somewhat wise, but none of them cared about humanity. In fact, human beings were slaves of those gods, and along comes Yahweh. And what he reveals is not just there's rules, he reveals that he wants a relationship with his people. He wants them, that's what he says. I will be your God and you will be my people. And out of this incredible, 
unheard of before relationship come the commandments. Here is God who says, I made you for joy. I made you for life. If you want those things, then live like this. That's why we realize the commandments are rooted in relationship. We know this about, about sins. Sins are never accidents. Sins are never mistakes. There's three requirements for a sin to be mortal. We know that there's two kinds of sins. There's venial sins that wound us and wound our relationship with the Lord. But there's also sins that are called mortal, and they actually kill our relationship with the Lord. And there's three requirements for every mortal sin. The first is, it has to be great man. It has to be a serious sin. What you might call like a big deal sin. The second thing is, I have to know what's a sin. I have to have um, full knowledge of the sin. And the third thing is I have to freely consent to that sin. I have to have full consent or I have to freely choose to do it anyways. Imagine this. My mom wants me to shovel the driveway, but I don't know that she wants me to shovel the driveway, so I don't shovel the driveway. What's the consequence of that? Well, unshoveled driveway. But is there a break between my mom and my relationship? No, because I didn't know. But imagine the story was different. Imagine my mom wanted me to shovel the driveway and I knew she wanted me to shovel the driveway and I didn't do it. Not only is the consequence of unshoveled driveway, but also there's now a break between my relationship with my mom and me. So often people think that a thing is only a sin because it hurt somebody. Or this couldn't be a sin because it didn't hurt anybody. But that was never the requirement. A sin is essentially saying this to God. God, I know what you want me to do, but I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. That's at the heart of every single sin. It doesn't have to be this crazy rebellion, and it doesn't have to hurt somebody. It's just looking at God saying, God, I know what you want, but I'm going to choose to do what I want. While every sin is personal, that involves a personal break in a relationship with the Lord, no sin is private. I mean, there might be secret sins that no one else knows about, but no sin only affects me. In fact, St. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, to those Christians, and one, at one point he said, don't you know that when one member of the body is strengthened, the entire body is strengthened? And also, when one member of the body is weakened, the entire body is weakened. That's what happens, is even if a person were to sin in secret and no one ever knew about it, it would weaken actually the entire church. And God loves you so much that he hates whatever hurts his children. Think about those people who hate cancer, the people who, who do like, you know, a walk against cancer. It's not, they probably don't do this walk because they hate cancer so much. They do it because someone they know, in fact, someone they love, has probably been hurt by cancer. And so their hatred of cancer is in direct proportion to how much they love people hurt by cancer. The same thing is true with God. God's hatred of sin is in direct proportion to how much he absolutely loves you. When sin hurts us, God hates it because he loves you so much. In fact, he loves you so much and he hates sin so much that he was willing to take the entire weight and consequences of our sins upon himself. When the Israelites looked at the law, they didn't just think about binding commandments, they realized that God was inviting them into a relationship. And when we as Christians look at the cross, we don't just see sin, we actually see the love of a God who is willing to embrace us in our rebellion, hate sin so much that he was willing to die so that we didn't have to die. Okay, so that was video two, so we're going to answer the questions for segment two, what is sin? So the first question is, which of these is a condition of mortal sin? So your options are A, grave matter, B, full consent, C, full knowledge, or D, A, B, and C. So by show of hands, who thinks it's A? Okay, by show of hands, who thinks it's B? Okay, who thinks it's C? And who thinks it's D? Good job, is this D? That's correct. So, you need to have, to be a, to be a mortal sin, you'll need to have a great matter, you need to have full consent and full knowledge. Good job. Now question true is going to be a true or false. The church distinguishes between private and public sins because some sin only affects us personally. How many people think this is true? Put your hands up. And how many think it's false? Put your hands up. Good job, it is false. 
Now this is false because all sin affects our relationship with others and with the whole church. This means that church does not accept that there can be private sin and public sin. All sin is sin and it affects our relationship. So looking back to the video, there is something that I want to expand upon that Father Michael Schmidt touched on, which is venial sin. So venial sin are sins that are wounds but do not destroy the divine life in the soul unlike mortal sin. Which can, and venial sins can normally be forgiven in the sacrament during, I mean, sorry, mortal sin normally can also be forgiven in the sacrament of reconciliation, but venial sin may only be forgiven by worthy reception of the Eucharist. So that venial sin, I also want to recap mortal sin. So mortal sin occurs when a gravely sinful act is committed with full understanding and consent of the will. If it is not repented, it deprives the soul of sanctifying grace, which is needed to enter heaven. And these are the definitions of both venial and mortal sin, which you can find at the back of your textbook. So now that you have these definitions, I am going to give you some scenarios, and I want you to put your hands up if you think it is a venial sin or a mortal sin. If you need a reminder, the definitions are in the back, so please just take a look at it in your glossary. So this is the first situation. So a drug, drug addict spends their money on f- spends money they should have spent on food for their family on more drugs. Now those who think this is a venial sin, can you please put your hands up? And then those who think this is a mortal sin, can you please put your hand up? Good job. Does anyone want to share the reasoning as to why? Anyone want to give it a shot? No, no. Clearly, so this situation can be considered a mortal sin because it meets all three conditions. So the drug addict spent their own money, which was supposed to be for food, on drugs, so this is with full knowledge. It was supposed to be food for their family, so by providing family with, by not providing food for their family, they committed a grave sin, and they also did it on their free will. So this consists of all three conditions, which means this is a mortal sin. Good job, everyone. Okay, another situation, a family gets COVID and misses mass on a Sunday. Now, do those who think this is a mortal sin, please put your hand up. And those who think this is a venial sin, can you please put your hand up? Don't see a lot of hands, so it might be a little bit confusing, but this is a venial sin. Because while the family committed a grave matter of not attending mass with full knowledge, they did not do it on their own will. So it did not hit one of the three conditions of mortal sin. They missed mass because they were sick. And according to the current regulations, they should self-isolate. So this is a venial sin that can easily repent it. One last one. So a group of friends make a plan to spread a false rumor that will destroy a classmate's reputation. Now those who think this is a mortal sin, please put your hands up. Good job. And those who think this is a venial sin, please put your hands up. So this can be considered a mortal sin. Because the group of friends committed a grave act to spread a false rumor about a classmate with full knowledge that this rumor would destroy this classmate's reputation. And the group of friends did this with full consent because they made a plan beforehand. Because it hits all three of the conditions of mortal sin, this is a mortal sin. So, thank you guys for your participation, and then looking at these three situations, especially the last two of mortal sin, the sins that affect the, affect the relationship with others and in turn with God. In the example of the drug addict, the addict harms the relationship with their family. In the situation with the group of friends, they harm the relationship with that classmate and maybe other classmates as well. Father Schmidt talks about this in the video. No sin only affects the sinner. Others may also get hurt from these sins. And for that reason, sin hurts ourselves, and God hates sin. And this is why he calls us not to sin, because it destroys the relationship with others and then in turn with God. So just a quick summary. Mortal sin breaks the connection with God and us. Venial sin weakens it. For sin to be mortal, remember it needs to have three conditions. It involves a grave matter, it must be done with full knowledge, and includes deliberate consent. So now we're going to go on to the third video and talk about the power of confession.
Okay, those outside, let's start coming back in. We want to start the final part of our program. Only God can forgive sins. But then Jesus gave his power of forgiveness to some pretty ordinary guys. This is really important. Jesus gave us the sacrament of reconciliation because he knew that we would need it. Sometimes it's easy to overlook this. Sometimes we can imagine that God said, okay, I'm gonna give you this sacrament of forgiveness, but I'll be very, very disappointed if you ever actually need it. That would make no sense. Jesus gave us the sacrament of reconciliation because he knew that we would sin, he knew we would fall, he knew that we would need it. So how do we go? First thing to do, make an examination of your conscience. Basically look at your life and say, where have I said, God, I know what you want me to do, but I want to do what I want to do? And make a list. You can take 10 minutes and do this really quickly. The second thing, get in here. Sometimes people say, I don't want to go to confession because it's been so long, I won't know what to do. Well, the priest, he went to school for this. He knows how it's supposed to go. So all you have to do, get in confession and say, Father, it's been a while, I'm not sure what to do next. And he'll walk you through it. Sometimes people are afraid though. What if the priest remembers what I say? What if he thinks poorly of me? I remember I used to ask priests that same question. Like, Father, do you think kind of badly of me? And he would always say, well, I don't even remember sins after you've gone to confession. I thought that was really nice of him to say. I didn't believe him. But now that I'm a priest, I know it's true. I rarely remember anything anyone said in confession. Priests are kind of like garbage men. They're kind of like God's garbage men. You know, if you ever talk to a garbage man and ask him, like, what's the grossest kind of garbage you've ever had to take out to the trash? They can rarely remember this because basically, once you deal with garbage a lot, they cease to be exciting. It ceases to be dramatic. It ceases to be really gross because you're used to dealing with it. The same thing is true with God's garbage man. The same thing is true with sin. After a while, it ceases being exciting. It ceases being gross. It just is just as what it is. It's just bad. And we take it away without being too shocked. 
what if a priest you know, says what I heard in confession? There is this thing called the seal of confession, which means that if a priest ever said what he heard in confession, he would be automatically excommunicated from the Catholic Church. That's how seriously the church takes your privacy. Sometimes people can be afraid the priest will think poorly of them for going to confession. The priest knows that everyone struggles. Everyone struggles. The fact that you're in confession is proof that you are willing to struggle for Jesus. Now, when you go to confession, one of the first things you want to do is tell the priest how long it's been since your last confession. Now, don't get too hung up on a specific date. Just give him a general sense of how long it's been. Um, because there's a difference. It helps the priest know what kind of advice to give. If you say, it's been 10 years and I talked back to my parents once, and that's all, then he can actually ask, let's, let's dive a little deeper, and he can actually help you. Then you start giving your confession. Now, when we give confession, we need to actually say all of our mortal sins. Remember mortal sins? Those big deal sins. I, freely, I knew were sins, and I freely chose to do them anyways. I need to confess all of those. And the church says that I need to confess them in number and in kind. Now, the number, again, don't get too hung up on being specific, but just give a general sense of how much this has been. Someone could say, well, like, I've taken the Lord's name in vain 88 times. I mean, 89 times. I mean, 87 times. I don't know. You could just say, I've taken the Lord's name in vain a lot. Again, it's the same kind of thing. Someone could say, well, you know, I stole something from work once, and I've been taking something home from work the last number of weeks, the last number of months. There's a difference in that kind of thing. So make sure you say that. And also what kind of sin it is. Now there's two traps people can fall into. They can either be way too general about what kind of sin it is, or they can be way too specific about what kind of sin. I need to name the sin. I have an older sister, and she once told me I could tell you this story. She said that she went to confession once, and she said, Father, one through 10. And the priest stopped, one, one through 10 what? And she's kind of brassy, she said, well, what the, the commandments, have you heard of them? And he said, well, have you killed someone? No. Have you committed adultery? Have not. She, we need to name the sin. Um, a priest friend of mine says this when it comes to having to include all the necessary details. He's a priest friend from Kenya, and he said, don't go into confession and say, Father, I stole a rope, and forget to mention that there was a cow attached to the rope. So I can be way too general. I also can be way too specific. I don't need to tell the story of the sin. Someone can go into confession and say, well, Julie and I have been best friends ever since first grade. Mr. Johnson put us in the third row together, except for the brief time in eighth grade when we weren't friends because she did this and I did this, she did this. But ultimately, I gossiped about Julie behind her back. All you have to do is go into confession and say, I gossiped about my best friend. We just need to name the sin in number and in kind and let the Lord's mercy and love transform us. Now, I need to confess all my mortal sins. But remember, there's two kinds of sins, mortal and venial. Those venial sins that wound our relationship with the Lord, those are great to bring to the Lord in confession as well because it's all about healing that relationship. When it comes to mortal sins, they all need to be confessed because, remember, relationship. To hold on to some mortal sins and not hand them over is like trying to come back to the Lord without really coming back. Sometimes people are afraid because they can't tell the difference between a temptation to sin and an actual sin. Remember, a sin has to actually be chosen by you. It's something you have to will, something you have to grab onto and say, I want this as my own. A lot of times we experience temptation, temptation to act, temptation to think, and that's not a sin. In fact, those temptations have no ability to hurt you until we choose them. So the difference between a temptation and a sin is all about whether or not we're willing to choose it or not choose it. Now, when you come to confession, so a lot of times you have the opportunity to be either behind the screen or face to face. Both are perfectly fine because you know that in both, you can completely trust the priest to extend the mercy of Jesus to you. I know sometimes people will stay away from confession because they feel like they say, I don't feel bad enough for my sins. I don't feel sorry enough for my sins. Well, that's the difference between regret and repentance. Regret is when we feel sorry for our sins. Repentance is actually making a decision to say, I'm going to turn away from my sins and turn back to Jesus. We don't need regret, but we do need repentance. It's the difference between Judas and Peter. Both men betrayed the Lord. Both of them regretted their sins. They both felt bad. They both went into the darkness of the night and wept for their sins. But only Peter had repentance, where he turned away from his sin and he turned back to Jesus. Think about what it would be like if Judas did not only regret his sin, but actually turned away from his sin and turned to the Lord. We'd be celebrating Mass in the church of St. Judas the Repentant. I often ask a person who says they don't feel sad enough, I say, is there any small part of you that wants the freedom and the forgiveness that Jesus offers? If there is, then you can go to confession. 
As you continue the journey toward the Sacrament of Confirmation, the Sacrament of Reconciliation is wide open to you. Before and after Confirmation is a normal part of our lives. Because we realize this, Confession is always a place of victory. It's a place where Jesus always gets the win. The purpose of your life and the goal of your life is to be a saint. The Sacrament of Reconciliation is where saints are made. I forgot to do the questions last time, so I'm going to do the questions today. So if you take a look at your book, we're in the last segment, segment three, the power of confession. Question number one. The blank of confession assures us that a priest would never reveal confessed sins. What is your answer for this one? So please circle it. Put up your hands if you circled A. Put up your hands if you circled B. B. Okay, put up your hand if you circled C. Okay, I can't see you though. Come sit up. Sit up. Where's the one who was sitting beside you? She's not there anymore. Anyway, uh, put up your hand if you chose D. Woohoo! Okay, that's the one. It is seal of confession. By the way, hate true or false questions. Here they come. Uh, oh, here's the one. In confessing our sins, we don't need to regret them, but we do need to repent of them. It's like a weird, weirdly phrased question. But anyway, in confessing our sins, we don't need to regret them, but we do need to repent of them. If you chose true, put up your hand. Okay, and to make sure everybody else is awake, I guess you chose B or false. So if you chose false, please put up your hand. Okay, and some people maybe there's like that weird phrase we, uh, the, the don't and then the commas. It's true. Okay? Because you want to make sure that you um, actually want to turn towards Christ. Okay? And last question, number three. Father Schmidt explains that we should confess our sins in blank and kind. In blank and kind. So you have number, humility, total. And fact, for those of you who circled A, if you could please, okay, just to make sure everyone else is voting, because not everyone's hand is up, B, C, D, I think we have A, okay, so A is the one, okay. Now, I know it took a lot of time last time, I just want to highlight two things in your book. Um, we didn't get a chance to uh, spend a week on baptism, however, can you turn to page 80 really quickly? Okay, I don't know if you have um, people you look up to. If I were to ask you uh, someone that you look up to in the world, is there anyone you particularly look up to? Uh, okay, you're gonna have to speak loudly, okay, go. Oh, your mom! I wish your mom was here so she could hear that. Your mom's not here to hear that, okay. So your mom, okay, can I have another one that isn't your mom now? Uh, just two more people, please. Who is, who are people that you look up to? People you look up to. Okay, either, uh, better that you volunteer and not until I volunteer told you. Yes, sir. Sorry, did you say something yet? Yeah. Your grandma? Oh, your grandma. I wish your grandma was here to hear that too. Can I please get one more maybe from this side? Let's go to the... Uh, in the back, there's a brother or sister team. Is there anyone you look up to? Your dad? Okay, good. Again, I wish your dad was here too. Okay, so the reason I'm um, pointing out page 80, we also have um, people we can look up to in faith. These are the saints. I don't know if you've been regularly reading about the saints, but this is one of my girls, okay, Josephine Bakita. Please take the time to read her story, okay? And then, of course, this week, if you go to page 90, seeing as we're talking about the sacrament of Reconciliation, or Sacrament of Confession, or RECO. Uh, please read about St. Augustine. Um, if you want, like, drama, and you want, like, saucy stuff, read about St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine had quite the conversion. 
And uh, he actually did a lot of crazy stuff, so much so, he has a book called Confessions. I haven't read it, this is my sister's book. But uh, eventually, it's on uh, my stand to eventually read, but if you want some of that, but great conversion story, please read about St. Augustine. Okay, so I'm not gonna take too long, well, not, definitely not as long as last time. We're gonna keep it uh, somewhat more practical today, because if you notice in the last segment, Father Mike was talking about going to confession, so we'll keep it that practical, okay? So the first question that I have for you, uh, better yet, let's have you think about it first. I need you to think about the last time you actually celebrated, and I purposely am using that word celebrated, the last time you celebrated the sacrament of reconciliation, so think about it. For some of us, it was recently. For some of us, it was long, like a long time ago. But I need you to think about that experience, so please think about it right now. Okay? Now, the last time you went to the sacrament of reconciliation, when you actually went, uh, I don't know if you know, St. Marguerite Duville, we have the two, see the two doors? Over here and over here, you can't really see, not the main doors, but to the side. I don't know if you noticed it when you came in. It's by the, um, the font, but we haven't been using it because of COVID. So if you take a look in the glass window for these people who are over here, you'll probably notice there's like this purple curtain. So people who are in this, you guys can look, you guys can see, so turn around and look, so you can see. It looks like a purple curtain, and there's a chair in front of the purple curtain. And then on the other side sits the instrument of, uh, uh, that through which Jesus forgives you in the sacrament of reconciliation. So we're kind of using that as the confessional, okay? First, I'm just going to get the guy in the front. If you could please sit up, because I want to make sure that you're here because you want to be here, okay? For the love of Christ, you want to be here. So please sit up, okay? All right. Anyway, can you please tell me what did it feel like when you actually went to the Sacrament of Reconciliation? Would it be the first time or the last time? What would it feel like? And you can be honest about it because uh, for me, it's sometimes like um, performing, not that you're performing when you're going to Sacrament of Reconciliation, but I used to play um, in piano competitions. Okay, piano competitions. And piano competitions, I don't know about you, but I had particular feelings before getting up to play in front of people I don't know on the piano by myself memorized pieces. So if it's too hard for you to think of what does it feel like when you go into or when you're, you're celebrating Sacrament of Reconciliation, can you at least give some ideas of what I might have been feeling before I went up on stage, sitting at the piano, performing in front of people I don't know? Ideas, please. How might I have felt? Hello, nice and loud, please. Hold on, say again. Oh, that's a good word. That's a, actually a, a good word for today, right? Um, a little bit, except for uh, I wasn't like paralyzed by it. But yes, definitely a little bit of that. I don't know if I'd actually call it anxious, but definitely. What are some other words that we might use other than anxious? But it could possibly have been that. I'm not sure at the time. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely scared even though I've been preparing for months and months, okay? Um, with that scared or fear, or maybe potentially anxiety, is there any like biological things that might be happening inside me as I'm about to go on stage to play in front of people I don't know? Think about it when you're presenting in class. Is there anything else that you feel? Biologically speaking? So all of you guys are nice and calm. Tell me about your heartbeat. What's your heartbeat like? Go ahead. Yeah. Very fast. It almost feels like it's coming out of your chest. And it's an honest feeling when you go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation to have that. Has anyone ever experienced something like that before going into the Sacrament? Celebrating the Sacrament of Reconciliation, put up your hand. One. Okay, hold on a second, let's just double check. How many, oh two. How many of you are like absolutely calm before going into the, like celebrating the Sacrament of Reconciliation? 
Put up your hand because only two said that their hearts are beating. Yikes. Oh, unless you might not remember. Uh, this is where I get to like promote. Make sure you celebrate that sacrament of reconciliation. Okay. So I'm going to end off with one other question. Like I said, I was going to try to keep it brief because I know the last time I spoke quite, for quite a bit of time. Uh, let's do some strategy. You guys are going to be celebrating the sacrament of confirmation. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be recommended that you celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation before that great event. Let's think up some strategies for each other so we can help each other out, okay? I might have to come to you because I, I don't know what's going on. How come it looks like we're fewer than we were before? I don't know what that's about. Anyway, how can we get ready to go to, so here's the question. How can we get ready to go to the sacrament of reconciliation? Let's think up some strategies, please. Here we go. So think about it. I use the example of going up to play um, piano in front of people I don't know. But to make sure that I was able to play, what are some things that I might have to do to prepare for it? I have to prepare. Uh, so for example, I would take a deep breath, okay? I would let my training just kind of like go and then I'd be able to play at the piano. But for the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Father Mike mentioned something that you could possibly do to prepare to go celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation. So can I please have an example or two that were mentioned in the video, and maybe we can help each other out come up with some other things. Okay, so what did he mention in the video? Let me just see who is here. Is your hand up? In the, is your hand up? Okay, can't tell. So how can we get ready? Okay, let me help you a little bit. Go to page 85. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of the Ten Commandments. But you can actually use this to help you prepare to celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation. So let's just try a few of them. And in fact, there's something called the Examination of Conscience. I think he mentioned it in the video. And this is kind of part of what you go through as you examine the things that you've done, chosen to do, to turn away from God. So think about it, here we go. Number one, and you get to think about this. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Has there ever been a time where you, never, where you did not put God first? Okay, so just reflect on that for a little bit. We're only gonna go through three, we're not going to go through 10. So can you reflect on that a little bit? I am the Lord your God, you, have, you shall have no other gods before me. Has there ever been a time where you did not put God first? Okay? What does that mean? Maybe you put something else first. Uh, I think in the video uh, they might have mentioned, did you put um, go attending a sports event ahead of God? Have you put playing video games ahead of God and worship of God? These are what we're talking about. Number two, um, Paula had mentioned something that she hates hearing um, as being related to number two. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And if you remember, Paula mentioned when people say, oh my, and say the Lord's name, with capital G, that's one way of like going against that commandment. There's another one I wanted to mention, because Paula had mentioned it, that is related. And I've been hearing it a lot more often. I'm like, ah. So when I say JC, do you know who I'm referring to when I say JC? The JC? Who's the JC? JC, yep. Good, now notice here in that context, we just said the name Jesus Christ. I asked what was the name, like what JC stand for, and the person just mentioned Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard, or maybe you've done it yourself, where you've said Jesus Christ in a different context? So for example, do you have an example? Okay, go ahead. Yep. 
Oh, Jay-Z, thank you for saying <laughs> Jay-Z. Did you say when people are annoyed? Oh, Jay-Z, exactly, okay? So that's context. So they're annoyed by something, you stub your toe, and then you say Jay-Z. Think of the context in which you're saying Jay-Z. You're not calling the Lord's name. You could actually like replace it with a swear word if you really think about it. Okay, so examination of conscience. You go through to the second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You think about it. Have I taken the Lord's name in vain? Have I misused it? Have I mistreated it? Okay, one more, because it's probably the one you can relate to, hopefully, the, well, not hopefully, but hopefully the most. Take a look at the commandment, honor your father and your mother. So examination of conscience to prepare to attend the sacrament of reconciliation. You ask yourself, has there been times that I've not honored my father and my mother? Okay, have I not treated them well? Have I not spoken to them well, on purpose? Okay? Anyway, I told you I was going to keep it shorter than the last time, so I am. But think about that, and I hope you do think about, um, you know, actually celebrating the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Don't forget, with sacraments, that is a great opportunity for God's grace, and in this particular one, God's mercy to forgive us for the things, the times that we have not chosen him. Okay? Thank you much. Okay, now to the heart. We are getting into sharing our experiences of confession. So in a simple term, I'm just going to ask, what do you consider confession to be? Just simply. In a very simple term, what is it? What do you think? Anyone? Okay, I see a hand in the back there. Can you project your voice? That's it. Asking God to forgive you your sins. It's very simple. That's a simple way to look at it. You have, you have acknowledged that you have sinned and you're asking God to forgive you your sin. Thank you. So I want to ask again, who do you think you're confessing to when you go to confession? Of course, you're going to kneel before the priest. And so who do you think you're confessing to? Anyone? Yes? Yes, we're confessing to God. You just need to have it at the back of your mind. You are confessing to God. So this leads me to the next question. Um... So how do you feel when you go to confession? How do you feel? Yes, I'm kneeling before the priest. I'm going to tell him my sins. But then I know I'm confessing to God. So how do you feel? OK, my friend, yeah. Father Roger, can you help me? Yes. Oh, you feel good. I like that. Yes. You feel relieved of your sin? Thank you. I like the word relieved. I'm just going to share my first, um, my experience with my first confession. I was 14. I wasn't as privileged as you that you get to have that in grade two, I think. I didn't go to a Catholic school growing up. So then I was 14, and I remember my first confession, I felt very embarrassed, right? 
And at the end, I felt so relieved. And that's why I like the fact that you're saying you feel good. I felt relieved that something, like a burden had been taken off me. So that feeling. But of course, it's natural to feel, okay, you feel embarrassed because you're saying all those things you've done. But in the end, you, uh, uh, the relief comes in. Thank you. So that is, so I'm gonna just, um, the part of embarrassment, I, I'm just gonna read what Father Mike says here in his book. It says, whenever someone comes to confession, you know how people feel sometimes, oh, the priest is gonna listen to all that you said, and they're gonna look at you in judgment. So he says here that whenever someone comes to confession, I see a person who is deeply loved by God, telling God that they love him back. That is it. And that's all. That's all the priest sees. He says, the priest stands in judgment of no one. So the feeling of, oh, he's going to judge me. No, that's not your job to do. They don't judge you. In the confessional, the only thing I have to offer is mercy. Whether you have confessed a particular sin for the first time, or if this is the 12,000th time, every confession is a win for Jesus. And I get to be there, standing for Jesus. That's what it is like. I get a seat and watch Jesus win his children back all day. It's actually pretty awesome, if you think about it. So, the feeling of judgment? No, it's not. It shouldn't be there, because that's not what happens. So, I'm going to ask you the question that is put here. It says, what advice would you give a friend who said he was too embarrassed to tell, to let the priest at his church hear his confession about a particular sin? What advice would you give a friend? I haven't heard all we've listened to today, the videos, all we've talked about. What advice would you give a friend? Anybody wants to go? Yes, you in blue. Please help me to be a little louder so I can hear you and others can also hear. Oh, thank you. That's it. Now we've known that the priest is not going to judge you. Thank you. So, if they feel too embarrassed to share, the priest wouldn't judge you. You just need to let them know. You know, I ask myself this question. If I am so embarrassed to go before the priest to tell him my sins, how embarrassed am I to commit sin? It's not a question for anyone to answer. It's just something for you to think about. If it's too embarrassing to confess my sins, how embarrassed am I to sin? Think about it, ponder on this as, as we think about the process of confession, when we go to confession, what happens after confession. I remember in the video, at some point he said, sin is a poison. If it's a poison, if I have sinned, I see confession as a process of healing. If I've taken in poison at confession, God takes me back. He wants to cleanse me. So that's what we should think about as we live here today. Thank you. Okay, final stretch. Let's talk about the challenge of the week for this week. Um, I actually want to make a small change to it, so if you guys have your pens ready. Um, the first challenge says talk about it, but we're in a pandemic, as we all know. So let's change it up a bit. Let's, why not instead, pick a commandment that we've been actively um, acting out in our daily lives, and just write a little sentence about it, like how are you actively participating in this, in, oh my gosh, in this commandment? Um, and then the second one says to take advantage of confession. Uh, confession is a great thing you can do at the church. We off they offer um, times on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6, and then Saturday at 4 p.m. So you can come to the church, you can have a chat with the priest, and you can confess your sins, and then 
you really get rid of that feeling of guilt that you might be carrying around. And the weight that it takes off your shoulders is so tremendous. I really recommend all of you come out to church and go to confession. Especially with what all of the leaders have been saying so far, um, the priest will not judge you. The priest will not tell your parents or whoever you're scared of about the sins you've committed. The priest is there to console you, give you help, and recommend prayers that you can do to really like help your heart. And then the final challenge is to choose your favorite story of redemption from the Bible or a fiction or nonfiction book and be prepared to summarize the story briefly. So the meaning of redemption is the act of being saved from sin or evil, but in terms of church and in terms of this program of confirmation, you can think of it as being protected and being in the presence of God's love because, because God loves us. Um, that's why he... That's why Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. So just know that no matter the sin you've committed, once you speak with God and console with him, you will always be forgiven because we're all children of God and he loves us so much. Um, Yeah, and so make sure that you guys actually complete the challenges because for our next session, which is on the 26th, I believe, we might be going back with the leaders, so you'll have a chance to actually talk about the challenges and share your experience or what you've written down. Um, So yeah, that's everything. Hope you guys enjoyed today's session, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Okay, thank you everyone. See you back here in a few weeks' time. God bless and take care.